We generally had great feedback to our climate battery video. In many of the comments, I saw several repeated questions, and while I've done my best to answer many of them, it's probably in my best interest and yours too if I address them more formally here where I'm able to do a slightly deeper dive. So if you haven't watched that video, I'd encourage you to do so before coming here, otherwise these questions will lack a bit of necessary context. So let's dive right in. As a brief aside, I'll try to keep my answers brief so this video doesn't run too long, but that may mean some of these questions aren't answered to everyone's satisfaction. Question number one, what happens to all the condensation? Don't your tubes fill up with water and don't the tubes fill up after a heavy rain? This question comes because of one of the beneficial aspects of climate batteries. When warm humid air comes into contact with cool piping, some of the condensation drops out, leading to drier air re-entering the greenhouse. However, that means that if the pipes were solid, that water would collect over time as it would have nowhere to go. Thankfully, most climate battery systems I'm aware of use perforated piping. These small slits allow any water that does collect in the tubes a path to drain out. That said, I will say if you live in an area with a high water table, water collecting in the pipes would be a concern, and in many could in many cases rule out the use of a climate battery. Also, if you have very heavy clay soils, that water may have a difficult time draining out adequately. Question number two, what about mold in the piping? So this is related to question one, with water in the piping, doesn't that lead to mold? Or perhaps simply the thought that since the pipes are underground where it's damp, that it would lead to mold forming. I can only speak to this experientially as well as relate experiences of other growers that I know with these systems to say that I've never noticed a mold related issue with the piping and neither have any of the people I've spoken with with operational systems. At the risk of repeating myself, the pipes we use are perforated, so any water that would come into them through the groundwater swells due to heavy rains or condensation forming in the tubing has a path to drain out. Perhaps there's a mold you can't smell, but I've never noticed a mold smell and I've never had an issue after working for hours and hours in there. So not saying it can't happen, but neither I nor anyone else I've dealt with running these systems have had an issue with mold. Question number three, what about pairing the system with solar panels? The fact that the fans run electricity leads to the question of whether solar photovoltaic panels are a good fit to be paired with a climate battery. While we're pursuing this on our farm, we had to make adjustments to our solar system sizing based on the usage patterns of climate batteries. Here's what I mean. Climate batteries see most of their use in the winter as well as the shoulder months of spring and fall, meaning the climate battery fans are running at night, often for 10 hours or more. So demand for electricity is often highest for a climate battery greenhouse in the winter months if you're choosing to use it for winter growing or for overwintering sensitive plants rather than just season extension. Unfortunately, you have the inverse problem with solar production. Solar production in winter is the lowest due to short days and weak sun. So in sizing a solar system to support a climate battery, especially if it's gonna be off-grid, you end up needing to greatly oversize the number of panels as well as batteries in the winter, which does you little good in the summer. There's certainly opportunity for grid-side solar systems to be used to offset the electricity used by these systems, and that's probably a better use case with summer production and offsetting winter demand. Question number four, what about radon in the greenhouse? This is a valid concern and one I've had in the past. In the summer and any time the greenhouse is regularly vented or completely open to the outside, there's likely very little concern at all as there's free and regular exchange of outside air. I've tested levels on one of our closed up greenhouses in our radon prone area of the country and haven't seen any worrying levels. If you live in an area of the country where radon is particularly bad, then perhaps having it tested is warranted. However, I think this would be of concern whether the greenhouse use a climate battery or not. The climate battery increases the amount of soil surface area you're interfacing with, but a regular greenhouse doesn't eliminate the concern. The short answer is that personally, I'm not all that concerned. It's not a living space and we're not spending an inordinate amount of time out there during the brief time of year when it would even be a concern. On top of that, we've tested the levels during the time of year they might be of concern and they're not worrying. Question number five, why didn't you put your intake at the top of the greenhouse? If you've watched any climate battery builds, you've probably seen them talk about the importance of placing the air intake at the peak of the greenhouse to capture the hottest air. Some of you have taken notice that we don't do that, instead placing intakes that need a waist height or so. So aren't we missing out on capturing the hottest air? I don't think so, and I'll tell you why. First, and maybe most importantly, our greenhouses operate horizontal airflow fans that run 24-7, 365. We run all of these in the active growing season and shut down two or half of them in the off season to save a little bit on electric costs. Horizontal airflow fans serve at least two purposes. The first is to keep a small current of air moving to prevent condensation on the plants and therefore reduce the risk of disease in a warm, humid environment. The second is reduced stratification where the warm air would otherwise tend to collect at the top of the greenhouse. This current of air produced by the fans cuts down on that stratification by constantly mixing the air. This is reason number one why we didn't feel we need to have a high air intake. There's just not a huge pocket of super hot air at the peak. 
Alongside that reason is another, the volume of air the climate battery moves through and recirculates in the greenhouse. By some back of the napkin math, our climate battery fans move through the entire volume of air in the greenhouse every five minutes, or about 12 times per hour when they're running. My thought then is that even if there is some warmer air in parts of the greenhouse, the mixing of the climate battery and the horizontal airflow fans make it such that we're essentially working through the entire volume of air in the greenhouse many times an hour. The third reason is just a practical one. I don't want huge tubes intruding into the growing area. As it stands now, I lose fairly little production area due to the inlet and outlet and can train my plants to grow around them. If I were to have a large pipe, that would greatly interfere with my ability to do that. The fourth reason is simply cost. Large culvert pipe like we use is expensive. The reason my pipes stick up to the height they do is because we took a 20 foot section and cut it into three equal sections to minimize pipe cost. I'll also take some time to mention here the wonderful SARE project done by fellow climate battery researcher Shannon mitchell Canals. I'll put a link in the description to the project where you can read his research. Shannon also found that a high intake wasn't beneficial and ended up removing it from his build. Question number six, why didn't you sink your greenhouse into the ground? Many ideas are good in theory, tricky in practice. Quite a few folks have gone down the path of building a submerged or partially submerged space. You get the benefit of thermal mass surrounding the greenhouse that can help passively collect and release heat, as well as reducing the effective surface area to help mitigate heat loss. So why didn't we do it? The main driver for us was cost. Building a sunken structure would have increased costs and decreased the likelihood that we could go with a conventional and relatively inexpensive structure. Our soils are such that simply excavating and building a structure on top without some kind of structure like the retaining walls to prevent the soils from softening off really wasn't workable. We're also on a relatively flat piece of ground, so we would have had to build up and grade the site, otherwise it would have tended to collect water. All this would have added to cost, and we're trying to build the largest structure we could for the least money. Yes, that has trade-offs, but at a certain price, we couldn't hope to pay for the structure with the crops that we grow there. Question number seven, why not build a better insulated structure? Similar to the last question that touched on burying the greenhouse for the benefits of doing so, insulating the greenhouse seems like a really good idea. You save on energy costs, in our case the cost of running fans, and possibly get an even longer growing season and warmer nights in the winter. Win-win. Again, our reason for not doing so comes down to cost. Insulation is expensive, and I haven't yet seen a cost-effective way to better insulate in a way that pays for itself in our climate, though in a more northerly climate, it may. As I mentioned in a previous video, materials alone for many of these better insulated structures are multiple times what a traditional hoop house frame costs. Yes, you do save on heating costs, but does that pay for itself over time? I haven't yet seen a compelling structure that accomplishes this. There's a lot to be covered here, but I'm trying to keep my answers brief rather than do a full analysis. So the last comment I'll say I'd love to be proven wrong here. So if you know of an economical but also better insulated greenhouse kit in the style of a Chinese solar greenhouse or something similar, let me know in the comments. Question number eight, why not a hydronic or water-based system? The thought behind the question I think goes like this. Water is both a better conductor of heat as well as a more efficient means of storing heat per unit of volume. So why not use it instead? While I'm very interested in the idea of storing waste heat or using water as a supplement, we haven't yet pursued it. My interest was first peaked in climate batteries due to the simplicity of construction as well as operation and the ability to store a large amount of heat, even though the soil isn't the most efficient means of storing it. Hydronic systems wouldn't be without cost. Solar collectors or some means of dumping heat into the water would be needed, along with a tank, large tank of some sort, piping, and likely radiators of some kind, along with controls to determine when to turn on the pump and the fans. If you're someone who has seen this implemented at a decent scale and done the work of sizing things, let me know in the comments or reach out to me via our website. Hydronic systems certainly have potential if you can size them properly for your particular need. Question number nine, why not use different backfill materials like crushed stone, rock, or sand? In two words, cost and effectiveness. First, cost. One of the major drivers when I think about designing climate batteries is trying to lower the barriers to entry. A major barrier to entry, maybe the largest, is insulation cost. Unless you have a free source of materials, ordering stone or almost any material by the truckload adds up very quickly when filling in a large area. Second, effectiveness. I could be wrong, but I think the idea behind proposing stone is the thought that it stores heat more effectively than soil. However, the volumetric heat capacity of damp soil exceeds that of crushed stone from the resources I can find, and the material would need to exceed soil by quite a lot to justify the cost of bringing it in in multiple truckloads. So for those two reasons, I typically just recommend backfilling with native soil rather than bringing in materials. Briefly, I'll mention that we did use a crushed stone bed of 1B stone when putting in our second greenhouse. This was done primarily to help in the backfill process by creating a sort of cushion around the piping to help avoid crushing any pipes on backfill. I can't say it provides any noticeable benefit that I can put a number to, but it does 
make for some interesting airflow characteristics in that system due to the porosity of the stone. Question number 10, why don't you run the system in the summer to pre-charge the ground? Simply put, we don't need to. Summer does that for us. Over the course of the summer, the heat in the greenhouse that hits the soil surface slowly makes its way down to lower depths, essentially charging the soil for us. So instead of needing to pre-charge the soil, I'd like to think of our job as keeping the soil topped up as we head from late summer into early fall. In our particular climate, we start topping up in mid-September while the sun is still relatively strong. In climates colder than ours, beginning this process in mid to late August might work better. For those south of us, later in the fall would likely work just fine, depending on your goals for your growing through the winter. The main point is I don't like running our climate battery fans unless there's something to be gained by it. And when the summer gives us warm soil for free, I don't feel it's worth it. Bonus topic, uh, matching your solution to your goals. Some of the comments I got on the video went this way. Why didn't you dig even deeper or add insulation or barrier structure or look at some sort of solar heat collector and the list goes on. There's a big temptation when building an energy efficient greenhouse to attack it from a bunch of angles. First, we'll insulate all the sides and then we'll dig into the ground and then we'll also add a climate battery and maybe even some extra thermal mass in the form of water barrels or rock walls. However, for the average grower, these types of structures just aren't economically viable. The cost of some or all of these features means that the structure can't pay for itself. So perhaps a better question is to ask how simple of a structure can I build and still get away with executing on my growing goals. We have something of a Goldilocks problem going on here. So on the one hand, if I over-engineer a structure, we run the risk of being greenhouse poor or designing something we can't ever afford. If this is a passion or a hobby, perhaps an expensive structure isn't a problem, but if you're a grower who needs to produce a certain amount to pay for the structure, a certain cost per square foot makes the payoff window unreasonably long. On the other hand, an under-engineered structure or a poorly planned one suffers the same fate. If you've only invested in a single layer of plastic when two would have been better for a little added protection, or if your climate battery design wasn't sufficient to make a meaningful temperature difference in your space, then you end up compensating for mistakes by other means. So essentially you pay a tax on poor or just misinformed decisions. However, a properly thought through structure keeps the upfront as well as ongoing costs relatively low while providing the environment your plants need in your particular climate. The sort of Goldilocks zone of not over-engineered or under-engineered can be tough to figure out because of the various factors at play. Your particular climate zone and temperature extremes, your growing goals for the space, along with the relative sunniness of your area of the country, all contribute to figuring out a just right for your climate. So it's definitely not a problem with a straightforward answer. The last thing I'll say is this, the how much is too much question likely looks different based both on your goals and your climate. For example, a zone three or four tropical greenhouse will likely look very different than a zone seven tropical greenhouse if you're trying to right size your design. If there's enough interest, I may do a deeper dive on just this topic, trying to right size your design for your particular climate. If that's something that's of interest to you, let me know in the comments. I sure hope those questions and answers were helpful and it's getting hot in here, so we're gonna get out of here. Is there a question you'd hoped I'd cover but didn't? Let me know in the comments. God bless and thanks y'all.